Okay, so uh, characterization in the Odyssey, and this is a, a, a little overview of the way in which Homer does this rather than specific things on individual characters. So just give you a sort of sense about how this actually might um, work in the way that he's written it. So there are, I think, five ways that Homer tells us about his characters. Firstly, through the words of the character themselves. Then you have the actions of the character. Other characters who make observations about that first character that we were thinking about. Homer sometimes makes remarks or explicit comparisons, particularly including similes about those characters. And then sometimes there are suggested or implied comparisons that you can draw out uh, from what's being said. So I'm going to just go through each of these five areas just to give you a little hint of it, and then you can add in your own thinking or examples to go with it. So firstly, the character's words. Homer uses what a character says to reveal what's going on inside of them. Okay, so, so actually, he doesn't usually state overtly what that character is like or what that character is thinking. He used the words. So, for example, in book one, Telemachus tells Penelope, go upstairs, I'm the man of the house. And what's actually happening there is Telemachus is expressing his desire to be seen as an adult, isn't he? Who's wanting to demonstrate his independence from his parents. And we know that... Um, that Telemachus is sort of on the cusp of adulthood, he's not quite there. So when he says, now go to your old quarters and attend your own work, the loom and the spindle, making decisions must be men's concern and mine in particular, for I am master in this house. And he then says Penelope was taken aback, but she retired to her own apartments, uh, for she took her son's sensible words to heart. Uh, I think that what's happening there is that Homer's saying Penelope sees what Telemachus needs at that stage. She sees who he is and who he's becoming. And so she allows him to do that. It's not actually stated, but there it is. And book six as well. Remember, Nausicaa has met Odysseus and she's talking to him about, oh, we must go in disguise back into the town, etc. And she um, she says, oh, imagine that we walked into town together, we bumped into a, a, a crude sailor. And she then says, I can well imagine one of the cruder ones saying, who is this tall and handsome stranger with Nausicaa? <laughs> Her future husband, no doubt. Now, in that single phrase, Homer's given us that sense about the worries that Nausicaa has about how she's going to be perceived by people, her worries about her reputation. But at the same time, he's also given us her fascination for Odysseus. Maybe a classic adolescent, constantly worried about reputation, but desperate to be with somebody who seems really interesting and, and attractive. I don't know. You'll have to decide that for yourselves. The character's actions. Clearly, Xenia is the big clue to a character in the in the Odyssey, isn't it? That's where you get the idea of, are you on board or are you a problem? So, at start, book one, Telemachus sees um, Athena. He thinks it's uh, uh, Mentes, a family friend, um, and invites uh, her, slash him, into the palace um, and uh, gives him a, a chair. And then at the... Uh, book six, when the other maids run away, and Nausicaa doesn't run away, even though Odysseus is grimy and uh, and disguising himself only with a branch. She stays there and she helps him. We immediately get this sense that Telemachus and Nausicaa, in their characters, are independent and reliable and good characters. On the negative side, Polyphemus, well, we, we know from his words that he's uh, dodgy because he says he doesn't respect the gods, but also he eats his guests. You might suggest that could put him on the negative side of the uh, the character side of things. The suitors, in addition, they show their true colours, don't they? They never bloom and leave. What are they doing? Clearly there's something wrong with them because they've abused Xenia. So there's our kind of classic kind of actions analysis coming through Xenia. There are observations by other characters, aren't there? Um, most of the major characters do have observations made about them by other characters. Now, Odysseus, we don't even see him until book five. I know we don't read books two to four, but by the time the story's got to book five, we know plenty about him. There's been stuff from Athene. There's been stuff from Menelaus uh, in books two to four. There's been stuff from Penelope. We've built up quite an image of him from other people. Phemius the Bard, um, when he's singing at the Phaeacian Games, he makes specific references to Odysseus, the events of Troy, he refers to Odysseus re receiving divine help, all of which shows Odysseus' significance. So, characters by words, 
by actions, by observations by other characters. Then we get to Homer himself. Now, Homer's well known for not saying a lot directly about his characters. He doesn't openly say, that's a goodie, that's a baddie, he's a terrible person, he's a great person. The clues are in similes, often extended, so that you can understand the meaning. Uh, an example is Nausicaa compared to the goddess Artemis. And actually, the extended simile takes this um, story about her beauty and how she stands out dramatically uh, from other people on a hunt. That's Artemis we're talking about. But of course, you draw from that that Homer's saying something about Nausicaa's beauty. Odysseus, meanwhile, we know there's a whole string of similes, aren't there? He's compared to a weeping woman, a skilled shipwright, a hungry lion. Those are all authored by Homer. They're all spoken by Homer to give you this sense of Homer's view on things. Then finally, there's the suggested or implied comparisons. Um, this gives us a grasp of people's characters beyond what we've got from the direct. So uh, uh, Odysseus's character is like Athene's. She loves disguise and deception. Odysseus loves disguise and deception. There are lots of examples, aren't there, all the way through. But look at book 13. She disguises him, her, him as a beggar in Ithaca when he comes back. And what does he do? He loves it. He launches into the role. He's enthusiastic. He's passionate. He's telling stories to everybody. And he's really part of the whole beggar disguise. And it shows us a little bit about his character that when we learn about Athene, we learn about um, Odysseus. So your response what do we do as the audience? Well, Homer doesn't judge his characters in the way that he presents them. And so that forces us as the audience to make conclusions ourselves. We're not told to what to think about people or what to, our views about people. Um, as a listener, you are compelled to be active, not passive, aren't you? That's the skill of Homer. He brings the characters to life. And he makes you think about their thoughts and their motives and ideas as if they're real people. Um, you may not even have thought, oh, are these really historical characters? You may just have been so swept into the story that you just believe they are real characters. And of course, without forcing a view upon you, it's made you engage with those individuals. So there we have character through actions, sorry, character through words, character through actions, character through the observations of other people, character through um, the, uh, the the work of um, Homer himself and character through this sort of implicit comparisons with other people. Um, and I'll just race you back so that you can have a look at that as your final finish. There are the five ways that Homer tells us about his characters.